call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Bristol Virginia City Council today, Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. Please join us for a moment of silence. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, good evening, everyone. We appreciate you coming out this evening. We want to go ahead and jump into our agenda. Our first item is uh, council comments. Are there any comments from the council tonight? I just have one. Um, so I heard it first thing this morning. Um, it's um, International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to to all the women out there. <laughs> City manager comments. Okay. Our next item is matters to be presented by members of the public, non-agenda items. And these are for items that are uh, not on the agenda. I wanted to go ahead and uh, uh, call the first person up to speak, and that's Mr. Chris Nup. Hello, everybody. I'm going to make mine short and sweet tonight, okay? Uh, appreciate you guys for asking some of the different questions. At least we're trying to find out what's going on with this landfill and everything. Thank you guys for this. Uh, I want to thank the Bristol Virginia School Board, my daughter-in-law, Kayla Nutt, teacher of the year, Washington Lee Elementary School. Had a little grandbaby, had a pretty good week. Uh, I hope the budget works out good for us, for everybody. We got a great city, I've said this before. Both sides, Virginia and Tennessee, we can make it good, got a lot of work. I hate all this stuff that's going on. I hate to be in anybody's seat here. I feel for you. But you guys are one, one of these seats too, so uh, let's make everything happen and hope everything does good. That's all I have to say, short and sweet. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Nup. The next person that signed up is Mr. Slagle. And Mr. Slagle, I know you uh, mentioned about the, the ball fields. I did want to go ahead, and you can come on up. I was going to direct the city manager to make a quick statement about the status of that, because there's been a lot of discussion in our community about the, the status of things. And uh, after he gives an update, if you'd still like to speak, you're more than welcome to. That's fine. Yeah, um, at the last council meeting, the only thing that council agreed to was to allow the Virginia High School girls softball team to play at Central Little League baseball field. There was no agreement, nor did council contemplate an agreement by any other Little League uh, baseball or Little League softball about where each team's field would be. It was actually the directive of council that those parties meet together to come up with a solution uh, amongst themselves and present that solution by June the 30th. So I know there's been a lot of discussion that city council's taking away ball fields and uh, not letting certain kids play on certain fields. That's not the case. Uh, the directive has always been that the parties need to work it out amongst themselves. Uh, you know, the city really doesn't play a role in it. You know, it's the kids' fields, and it's for those organizations to make sure those kids have the appropriate places to play. And I think the city council, and I know myself, will always support the people who use those fields if they can come up with a solution that best suits everybody. I appreciate that. I'd still have to speak if I may. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, to my knowledge, Bristol Virginia Little League Baseball is the longest running youth sports program in our city. Um, it actually started as Bristol Youth Baseball in 1950. Eastern Little League was chartered in 1952. Uh, I think some of the misunderstanding here is Bristol Virginia Little League Baseball never approached the city about giving up a ball field. Um, we were approached by the school board and 
I wasn't in the meeting. I know I was in the Little League meeting where the agreement that was told to us was we give up Central to become a Little League softball field. In return, they would pull the sod off of Central's field, put it on the Holland View to make it a baseball field. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, in the meeting that you guys had the other day when this was discussed, the question came up, is Little League on board with this? Well, no, we weren't on board with that. We, we weren't on board with uh, losing a Little League baseball field and that being that. Uh, currently, as it stands, there's one dedicated Little League baseball field in the city. There are six softball fields. Um, I'm all for everybody playing. I'm a Little League guy. I'm, I'm all for Bristol Virginia Little League softball, just as I am for Bristol Virginia Little League baseball. But uh, just to give you a brief oversight is we we are required by Little League Baseball to be tournament eligible for each team to play 12 ball games per year, per season. Last year, we played 98 ball games. And that's running from 1st April to 1st June, including rain out days, weather days, and things like that. With one Little League Baseball field, I can't do that. June 30th, Little League season is going to be over with. I would ask that uh, we, if we could expedite this. I know that I'm to be involved in a meeting on Thursday, I think. I'll be there. But I would, I would ask the city, uh, again, Bristol Virginia Little League softball is a great program. Bristol Virginia Little League baseball pro is a great program. Little League has been my life my entire life. Six softball fields, one baseball field, doesn't make sense. With Central being the dedicated high school softball field, you have a dedicated softball field with an eyesight at Bell Meadows. Have your softball facilities there. You have Eastern and you have Holland View a block and a half, two blocks away. For the last roughly three years, the city doesn't mow my ball field, I mow our ball field. We mow the ball field. I can drive the lawnmower to Holland View and mow that ball field. I can't haul it to Bell Meadows, and I know the city's short-staffed when it comes to maintaining the ball fields. Mm -hmm. Bristol Virginia Little League Baseball has put the field lights in. We've hung a scoreboard at Central. We've hung a scoreboard at Eastern. Six, six softball fields to one Little League baseball field, that's not doing the children of our city any justice. It, it only makes sense you got your high school softball field there at Central. You got another softball field at Bell Meadows, a tenth of a mile away. You got Eastern Little League field on Valley Drive. You got Highland View, a block and a half away. To my understanding, Virginia High School softball, which my granddaughter plays for, has shared a field with Little League softball for years, and there's not been a problem. The high school softball program's practices are over with around 5 30 6 o'clock mm -hmm. i know at little league baseball we don't ever start practicing at six because there's a lot of parents that still have a hard time getting in there by six because they have to work it makes sense to me to have your softball facilities there baseball facilities here well, let's all play and have a good time the the city of bristol didn't build eastern little league field the board of directors and the volunteers of bristol virginia little league Bristol Eastern Little League at that time built that ball field as the same thing happened at Central Little League field. At some point in the mid 70s, the city took over the fields. That was when Bob Childress was director of Parks and Rec. I have no idea what the deal was, what the agreement was. Those fields weren't built by the city. They were built by the people of Little League. I can't speak about Highland View and Bell Meadows. I don't know. The press box at Eastern, when I was seven years old, I was mixing mortar to put the block together to build that press box. Eastern Little League built that press box, the city didn't. I know they're owned by the city, and I know I really can't say what's to be done with them, but I would ask you, let, East, let, let baseball have Eastern Highland View, let uh, softball have Central and Bell Meadows, and we'll work in any way possible to help softball. Softball hosted a state tournament in 2018. We actually converted our baseball fields into softball fields. 
so they could play on our baseball fields. You can't, it's, it's a whole lot harder to convert a softball field into a baseball field than it is a baseball field into a softball field. I'll share with anybody and I'll get along with anybody. I, we're going to be ladies and gentlemen about it. But let's, let's not hurt the kids at Bristol Baseball. And Mr. Slagle, just to conclude uh, Mr. E's comments, there will be a meeting, is that correct, this Thursday? Meeting Thursday at 4 p.m. And just to reiterate, okay. the city did not initiate this process. We didn't, we weren't the ones that started, you know, the discussion on this. This was brought to us by, you know, uh, the schools as to how to move forward and, you know, based on our understanding and based on discussions, quite frankly, that I had with the previous Little League Baseball president you know everybody seemed on board with the solutions that were presented um, the city doesn't have a dog in the fight you know we want the organizations to work together to find the solutions that best suit each organization's needs and we're willing to sign off I think on what these organizations present it's just a matter organizations need to work together and communicate and maybe the solution is nothing changes um, if, if nothing changes now sir I'm left with one baseball field and there's okay. six softball fields. And, and, may, and we can fix that. But, you know, organizations are going to need to work together, and whatever the organizations present to us is what we'll be fine with. So we'll have everyone in the same room Thursday to, That's right. to put our heads together and figure it out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Slagle. Right. The next person that signed up for public comment is Mr. Danny Christian. I just want to know why it seems like the city singled my family and I out. You thought us out of our home for no reason. You took everything we owned for no reason whatsoever. I was living at home, my bills were paid. I lived in a five bedroom house, had an eight week old son. I'm still living on the streets. You took my means to make money because you left me with nothing but the clothes on my back. No social security card, no ID, no nothing. I get a birth certificate, can't get, can't get nothing else. And I can't get no help. Randy knows. I don't want to sue the city for five, uh, half a million bucks, but I just want my life and my family back. My wife did six months in jail over this. One of your city police officers lied to a DSS officer, cost me a reckless endangerment of a child charge. Well, that was crazy. I mean, this city has done me wrong. And I just, you know, I need some help. Mr. Christian, we appreciate you coming. We'll definitely meet afterwards and, and see what we can do to figure this out. Thank you. Th thank you for coming, Mr. Christian. That was the last person that signed up for public comments for non-agenda items. Now we're looking for a motion from the council to adopt our agenda. Uh, I move for the adoption of the agenda as presented. Second. A motion and a second to adopt the agenda. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. Okay, the first item of our regular agenda is presentation of non-mandated non outside agencies. Uh, nobody signed up for public comment for this item, and we'll just go down a list here of... Uh, presenters in order. The first person I have here on my list is I'd like to invite up uh, Believe in Bristol. Hi y'all. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm Maggie Elliott. I'm the executive director for Believe in Bristol. Believe in Bristol is an accredited program of Tennessee Main Street, Virginia Main Street, and the National Main Street Center. For nearly two decades, we have worked in partnership with both cities of Bristol to sustain and develop downtown as a vital economic, cultural, recreational, residential, and historic center for our community. Believe in Bristol's mission is to foster the collaborative, vibrant nature of both Bristols by building a community of culture, lifestyle, heritage, music, and economy. 
Believe in Bristol strives to strengthen the heart and soul of our historic downtown and facilitate its future growth. First and foremost, what you already know us for. Uh, we are a recipient of the American Planning Association's Great Places of America Award, something we're very proud of. State Street was recognized as one of the 2018 great streets in the nation. You also know us for some of the regular community favorites, including Border Bash Summer Concert Series, the Star Spangled Fourth of July Celebration, State Street Trick or Treat, Small Business Saturday, Christmas Open House, Christmas Tree Lighting, and Journey's End. But Believe in Bristol is more than just events. We also assist with and coordinate our own merchant meetings, guide property owners through historic preservation best practices and financial resources, cultivate creativity through the Arts and Entertainment District, host loft tours, and one of our favorites, host the Entrepreneur Grant Competition, which we have just embarked on our seventh installment of, where we received 73 applications, interviewed 32, and have accepted 17 new and expanding businesses into our six-week training program that, we re that will result in five businesses winning a total of $80,000 in grant money. You heard that correctly. We are also partnering on a $150,000 grant through Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development with the City of Bristol, Virginia's Economic Development Department and Discover Bristol to partner a Made in Bristol entrepreneurial program which will assist in leveraging small scale production businesses within the City of Bristol. This is all just to name a few that is produced via one full-time employee and one part-time employee. Downtown Bristol has achieved economic revival in the past decade and a half by concentrating and investing in community assets in our downtown commercial corridor with the goal of supporting the cluster of locally owned small businesses, fostering an accessible entrepreneurial ecosystem, improving the quality of life, and promoting an inclusive sense of place that retains and attracts residents and visitors respectively. No one in this room is new to the story of downtown Bristol's history and success. At one glance downtown State Street, you can see the progress that has been made for decades. But I want to talk more about why it's important to main that progress. Hit it, Keenan. Main streets are the heart of our communities. They're our nation's gathering places, places of shared memory, celebration, and economic activity. Today's main streets are resilient through hard work, planning, commitment, and action by local volunteers and leaders, Main Streets across America are thriving. Main Street America is a nationwide movement with a proven track record of revitalizing older and historic downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts. The Main Street America network brings together thousands of passionate local leaders who contribute their time and ideas to building more vibrant and sustainable communities. Today, people are seeking out communities with character and places where they feel connected. Main Street America downtowns and districts are places to raise families, start new businesses, build community, and forge the future. All right, now that we're all hyped on Main Street, let's focus on some Bristol specifics. Maybe. You put, thank you, okay. Downtown Bristol is where our earliest and most important history occurred. Downtown Bristol is the cultural center of our community. Its buildings embody the community's past and its visual identity. Downtown Bristol has the strongest identity and sense of place in our community. When people travel or shop, they want to see unique places, especially ones that offer a unique experience. What more of an experience can you get than being in historic downtown Bristol? being in two places at once, experiencing what Southern hospitality truly looks like. Downtown Bristol is a key ingredient to Bristol's quality of life, and a high quality of life is important for multiple reasons. Downtown Bristol is critical to the local and regional economy. Downtown Bristol offers the greatest opportunity for development that is most valuable to the local economy. Downtown Bristol provides the greatest opportunity for, fi for fiscal efficiency, by reducing sprawl and concentrating retail in one area, downtown Bristol uses community resources wisely, such as infrastructure, tax dollars, and land. The cost of doing nothing in downtown Bristol could be crippling. 
Development in downtown Bristol benefits the environment. Downtown Bristol is the healthiest place in our community. Downtown Bristol is, of course, our postcard location. But most importantly, downtown Bristol is owned by everyone. And that's why I'm here. Downtown commercial districts are prominent employment centers. Downtown Bristol is a great example of that with 170 businesses and almost 1,200 full-time employees. 563 on the Virginia side of town, currently making downtown Bristol, Virginia's largest principal employer according to the 2021 fiscal year audit. That is collectively, of course. Downtown Bristol is a positive reflection of community image, pride, prosperity, and level of investment which are critical factors in business retention and recruitment efforts of industrial and professional businesses and commercial, and commercial developers. The Main Street District represents a significant portion of the community's tax base. If the district declines, property values drop, placing more of a tax burden on other parts of town. Real estate, is, real estate assessment just for the Virginia side of downtown is currently approximately $20.5 million. Over $533,000 was collected in restaurant food tax by the city during the 2021 calendar year, and lodging tax just within downtown brought in over $450,000, which is four times what it was in 2019. An admission tax collected by the city was over $35,000 just last year. Obviously, 37,000, but round numbers, right? The commercial district represents a huge public and private investment. Since 2006, we have seen over $17 million in public investment and over $53 million in private. In 2021, $400,000 in public investment from Bristol, Virginia was leveraged against $1.7 million in private investment on the Virginia side of downtown alone. That's a lot of money being poured into one location. People care about downtown that much to not only put their dreams, but their assets into downtown Bristol. Status quo is not an option. We cannot take away investments or lose focus on what's continued to bring a return for our community. Downtown Bristol is a known financial generator for our cities. Because Believe in Bristol is known for producing quality programs and special events, are reliable and fiscally responsible, and naturally, because downtown is the community space, space in which we gather, we become that go-to resource for the cities to come when that planning or legwork is needed. We take those additional responsibilities on with community pride as we rally our volunteers. Our organization alone has brought in a value of over $1.3 million to the community just in volunteer hours. With so much on our plate, our organization cannot be put in a position to figure out how to keep our own lights on while also supporting our small businesses and fostering the entrepreneurial ecosystem that is downtown Bristol. As expectations rise from both cities, so does the cost of sustainability. Downtowns and urban commercial districts like downtown Bristol won't recover from the economic impacts of the global pandemic simply by way of government, government proclamations to reopen or marketing campaigns that bring customers back downtown. In turn, Believe in Bristol has identified key strategic goals for our organization. First, fostering a, th a thriving and diverse storefront economy that supports downtown Bristol's business community, excites visitors, and meets the needs of our residents. Cultivate a lively and engaging downtown atmosphere that identifies downtown Bristol as a destination for locals and tourists alike. Third, create a truly welcoming environment that enhances the experience of downtown Bristol's visitors and residents. And fourth, increase belief in Bristol's organizational effectiveness and ability to deliver on its mission now and in the future. We plan to execute, execute those strategies with a few special areas of focus for 2022. Which brings me to what's next. Um, when I say that we do have a few areas of special focus, that comes from our transformation strategies. Um, that we try to put a special focus for our special events. And for downtown Bristol, that is arts and entertainment and food experience. So what's next on our plate is public art projects and creative placemaking. In addition to that, um, increase food experience activities and businesses that support those activities, such as Bristol Pepper Festival and a restaurant week. Working to establish a downtown gift card program 
Of course, continuing our community events, both familiar favorites and new. Monthly merchant meetups and business training. I previously um, talked about our entrepreneur grant competition. That's literally classes start next week. Um, the Made in Bristol program will have an additional set of specific training as well. Um, and those are just two targeted programs, but we do provide those trainings and um, services for our merchants, free for our merchants on a year-round basis. Development of a co-working space downtown. Um, this is my, my buzzword in all of our meetings, but it is getting closer and closer to reality. We're really looking forward to being able to expand our, our job creation within our downtown district. And one that I am very biased over, but very excited about a downtown speaker system that has a shipping date um, in front of me, and I won't say it because this is public record and I don't want to be held to it, but uh, before our summer concert series kicks off, we will have those downtown speakers up, and I'm very excited about that. And thank you to the city um, for, for participating in that program. Our organization must receive support from the city of Bristol, Virginia to survive. We're working every day towards getting our organization to a more sustainable state and to not be reliant on our city's financial support. We understand the financial burdens the city has faced in the past and challenges of the future, and Believe in Bristol has taken those previous budget cuts with grace as we pulled up our bootstraps and got to work. But we do see the cracks beginning to show and do not want our downtown community to suffer in return. We have to invest in what is working in Bristol, and downtown is working. People are moving here because they're falling in love with downtown Bristol. We cannot lose that momentum. Bristol has many things to look forward to, including the upcoming Hard Rock Resort and Casino, an increased likelihood of passenger rail. It's gonna happen, it's really gonna happen. We must not forget what made Bristol a viable option for those investments. The pandemic has of course been very painful, but the momentum of downtown Bristol is not stopping anytime soon. As we have begun this new year, we know that these challenges continue, but as an organization, we have shown that we can adapt to whatever is thrown our way, and we are ready to continue that work. You'll see the breakdown of what our fiscal 2023 ask is of the $50,000. That's, of course, to expand our existing businesses, um, again, to continue that training um, and to enhance our, our existing entrepreneur grant competition and other entrepreneurial efforts. Um, to be able to bring new and exciting things to downtown Bristol, which of course um, we target to, to our community members um, that tourists can obviously enjoy as well, but our number one priority is providing those services free to the members of the public. Um, so you'll see um, examples of new, ex new things as such as a wine walk, a New Year's Eve event, increasing those public art projects and creative placemaking. Um, and then also, of course, increasing the visitation to downtown Bristol. We're, ve we're a very um, event-driven community, of course, um, but we can't rely on that to keep our businesses sustained downtown. So increase, um, increase the visitation, but also to our website, social media, and continuing our community partnerships so we're able to, to enhance that, um, that traffic. Okay, so in summary, um, a few key takeaways. Believe in Bristol has, um, Increase the tax base, partner to create and increase tourism, increase property values, increase the number of jobs, provided and encourage positive perception of downtown and community, improve relations with local government and the private sector, increase the volunteer base for the cities, created a business friendly environment in downtown Bristol, and produce quality programs and special events for downtown businesses and locals. In short, we get things done. The Walker Collaborative assessed all of downtown Bristol during the Bristol development strategy at the end of 2018, and we've since uh, revisited this as we, we see light at the end of the tunnel, so I'll leave you with a note from their report. In addition to the need of Believe in Bristol to support downtown, the community needs to support Believe in Bristol. It is critical that Believe in Bristol focus on its attention on, focus on, of its attention on proactive measures to enhance downtown as opposed to the time-consuming distractions of raising all of its own funds. And thank you so much, or just thank. <laughs> all right. Formatting. Any, any questions for Matt? Uh, I don't have a question per se, but I, I have something to say. So obviously thank you uh, for this. And I, I'm going to tell you a little story that I hope you appreciate. Um, last Saturday, I had the opportunity to bring somebody to downtown Bristol who had never been to Bristol. And uh, 
it was, I got to experience it for the first time again. Um, and you know, they were so impressed, they want to come back in a week or two and hit the things we missed. And I think that the fact that of the Tri-Cities, Bristol has the best downtown is, maybe I'm biased, but I, I don't think that's disputed. Um, it's incredible, as someone who's on the outside, and you know, we don't get to see that because we're here, to, to hear how impressive our downtown is. And, and truly it is impressive, and a lot of that just comes right back to the work you all do. And I think that's readily apparent with that, uh, with that presentation. Thank you, I appreciate that. It is very nice to see, see our community, especially downtown through, through visitors' eyes. Maggie, thank you for that presentation. I just wanted to say um, thank you for what you do with the entrepreneur challenges. I think that has really helped to bring businesses to downtown Bristol and create awareness to that, those spaces that we have open on both sides, both sides of the street. Um, I'm excited that you had that huge number turnout of people who are wanting to either start or expand a business in downtown Bristol. Um, and to hear that, you know, that many put in an application and now you said you had 32 businesses that will go through the program? We interviewed 32 from the 73 and were able to accept 17 into the program. Okay. And that's not including the separate Made in Bristol small scale producers that were able to help in addition. Great, well, great job on that. Thank, and you. thank you. Thank you. We were overwhelmed as well. It was a good overwhelming, but um, as we've seen in, in historical um, trends post recession, um, people, the entrepreneur activity kicks up, but 73 applications blew us away and we were very excited. So I'm just curious time. too, um, as to what types of businesses was it, um, did you see a particular type that people were going for or was it there's, kind of a little bit of everything? There's a little bit of everything. Um, something that really stood out to us, there's a decent bit of retail, but retail experience, which as we found, of course, retail is very hard to compete, of course, with the online market. Um, and people are, are spending their money and investing in those experience things that they can do with their families or a date night or whatever. And so seeing new businesses come in that want to incorporate those experiences with retail or just being just a, a purely experience based business um, really got us excited and especially about the sustainability of those types of businesses. Great. And when will we know who, who wins these competitions? Um, so they start their six week um, program next week. And um, we have a Shark Tank style pitch night that will take place the beginning of May. So currently it's tentatively, ske tentatively scheduled for Cinco de Mayo. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. All the work that you and, excuse me, all the, the volunteers do. I, I don't think people realize that's just one and a half or people that, that kind of lead in a lot of, uh, yeah, and an army <laughs> of volunteers. Uh, that do this, and uh, particularly in the presentation, I appreciate uh, highlighting, uh, you know, the economic impacts, and 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 that was um, really good. W one thing I didn't see that ask, and, and if you know this, if you don't, that's fine. Uh, but just it seems to me, over th even despite the pandemic, that a lot of storefronts you walk downtown you you kind of drive through used to you'd see some empty buildings that now it seems like most places there's something there and i was just wondering what the the like the occupancy or okay. vacancy rate is because uh that's a good problem to have as, as you run out of space i know sometimes <laughs> things you know kind of move or, or they start downtown they may go somewhere else but a lot of them have been there for a long time but i was just curious if you had any sense of what that rate was yeah occupancy. thankfully i do <laughs> ask me a question i knew uh 12 percent <laughs> is what our vacancy rate is right now which is wonderful um it's not the lowest that we've been in um in our tenure and that's because of of course the the pandemic did I did see a few extra losses. Um, our lowest was 10% for frame of reference. Um, but I would say with the increased entrepreneurial activity, we'll be right back, if not lower vacancy rate, um, even in just the next um, next six months to a year, of course, um, to fill in those vacancies. But we were very fortunate also through, um, through the pandemic and we did not have as many closures as what I've seen in in very similar communities, both on the Virginia side of town and the comparable communities on both the Virginia side of town and Tennessee or Virginia 
side of the state line and Tennessee's side of the state line. So um, we've, been, we've definitely been counting our blessings but didn't want to lose that momentum. So having the opportunity to provide the um, entrepreneur grant competition to this level, um, now was the perfect time yeah. to, to help with that vacancy rate as well. That's it, and I'll, you know, I know Councilwoman Ave uh, mentioned that entrepreneur grant. I think it's great, and I've been to some of those where they mm -hmm. come and at the end they talk about what they're doing. And, and I think uh, that's really good because not only are you current encouraging people to start new businesses, but your businesses that I have seen over time start downtown and continue to grow. So, uh, you know, it does work. You're planting seeds and, and we're starting to see the results of some of those. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Maggie. I just wanted to say thank you for presenting all this information to us this evening. And, and I agree with what you said about People look to move to Bristol. They look at downtown, and, and to piggyback on what Mr. Osborne said, I, I, I too, you know, will bring people who are coming here to this area from outside of this region um, to try to show off the area. And I'll tell them a little bit about Abingdon and Kingsport and Johnson City, but I'll actually show them downtown Bristol. And downtown makes it easy to to sell Bristol, and a big part of that is you guys. So we appreciate that. And. Um, um, just a quick question. You guys uh, also, one thing that was not on the board, are involved with helping uh, with the 4th of July fireworks? We do well. the 4th of July celebration. So do you know if we'll have fireworks this year in Ooh, downtown Bristol? Mayor. It depends on our, your funding. Is that, it depends on yes. our funding. OK. All right. <laughs> well. Set yourself up there. We'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> We've got some work to do. We are trying very hard to, to get everything back in line after missing, obviously, the last two years. Mm -hmm. So, Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go ahead and call up the, uh, the next agency on our list is the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. I'm Shauna Tilson, and I'm the Director of Development for the Birthplace of Country Music, so thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, I believe you all have packets in front of you, possibly, that I dropped off earlier today. So that is a copy of the presentation that I'm going to deliver to you all. It also has information uh, on our branches for you to look at later if you're interested. So I wanted to start out with uh, a few words from Marty Stewart. Bristol is the absolute bedrock upon which the entire empire of country music and many tributaries uh, therein are built. It's always nice to, to hear nice things like that. Um, so when I was preparing this request and we were all working on it over at BCM, we decided to, to really dive in deep and research the, the comprehensive plan that you all have and the vision for the future to make sure that what we're doing aligns with what, what your goals are and that our ask makes sense. Um, and when I was reading the vision booklet, the Bristol of 2034 describes Bristol as being fun and exciting and a great place to be and a premier destination. Uh, and it also discusses <coughs> utilizing tourism and the revenue generated from tourism to, to lower property to cost, property tax costs uh, to be competitive. And I really think that the birthplace of country music is not only part of that, but a driving force behind all of those things. Uh, and with that in mind, we are respectfully requesting $50,000 in funding. And so our mission, uh, we have quite a long mission, so I always like to break it down into three sections. Um, we seek to perpetuate, promote, and celebrate Bristol's rich musical heritage. Uh, we work to educate and engage audiences worldwide regarding the history, impact, and legacy of the sessions. And something that I think is really important to the city of Bristol is that we create recognition, opportunities, and economic benefit for our local and regional communities. So we have three branches, uh, Radio Bristol, our museum and also Bristol Rhythm and Roots. Having the museum and having a radio station and having a festival, it's kind of like one-stop shopping and it'll just get better and better over time. So those are just a, a little summary of kind of what's so great that we have all three of those things. 
Uh, I wanted to dive in a little deeper to, to each branch and some of the big numbers from each branch. Uh, so Radio Bristol, you know, is located within the museum and airs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, actively promoting Bristol worldwide. So we have listeners in 50 states and 140 countries. Uh, and I'm not sure if you all are familiar with our flagship program, Farm and Fun Time, uh, but it's PBS syndicated, a PBS favorite, and it actually is available to over 18 million people weekly when it airs on PBS, and we are actively working to increase that footprint. Uh, so that's a lot of visibility for the city of Bristol. Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion. Uh, so these numbers are from 2021, and I think they're pretty incredible considering that the Delta variant popped up, right? You know, right at the beginning. Uh, and to, to think about if we're able to, to do this with that going on, what we're gonna be able to do in the coming months uh, when things are a little more stable. So we had 27,000 festival attendees, uh, visitors from 612 cities, 42 states and three countries, um, 17.5 million, festival media impressions. We had over 40 media outlets from all over the country and a few other countries uh, with a combined audience of 839 million. Uh, so that's a lot of visibility of things that are happening right here. A lot of people learning about Bristol um, and thinking, hey, we should go there. Also, I included the economic impact from non-regional visitors. Uh, that study was from 2015, and it showed that $16.1 million were brought in from non-regional visitors. Uh, we're planning to have that study done again in a couple years. We were gonna do it in 2020, but you know, 2020. Uh, so we're really excited to see what those numbers are, and, and when we look at the festival attendees, we think that we'll see an increase there. Then we have our museum. Uh, again, these numbers are from 2021, so these are post-pandemic or during the pandemic. Uh, we had 18, over 18,000 museum attendees, and they're from over 2,000 cities, 50 states, and four countries. So we're really taking Bristol international uh, and bringing people in from all over the world. We, one thing that we do a lot of is we bring in tour buses, so we go to different conferences and, and promote this area. Uh, so during that time period, we had 26 group tours, um, and we've got more than that already scheduled for this year. Uh, before the pandemic hit, we were expecting around 70 group tours, so we're really looking forward to see what kind of numbers we're gonna be able to bring in this year. So I wanted to speak a little bit about our justification for funding. Um, again, I know the funding request highlighted the seven strategic focus areas, and I read a lot about those in the strategic plan, or the comprehensive plan, uh, and a lot of the same themes in the vision for the future. And while I was reviewing those and, and studying those, I really noticed that there were so many things within those that we are actively doing. Um, so I just wanted to show that here. The first is economic hub. Um, you know, in order to become an economic hub, you have to be a place where businesses really want to be. And one thing that attracts them is what is life like for their employees outside of their work hours? What is the quality of life? And that is something that we do a lot to improve and provide excitement and things that people can do in their free time. Um, and also it's important for employers to, to see that a place is thriving and actively growing and those are both things that we're contributing to. The next thing is Destination Bristol. Uh, so tourism, um, and we welcome visitors from all 40 states, or all 50 states and over 40 countries when you look at the festival and um, the museum combined. So we're definitely doing that. One thing that is unique about how we're doing it and a little different than how other people may be doing it is that we target the heritage travel traveler. Uh, and studies show that heritage travelers are likely to spend more money and stay a little longer, which are both really good things for driving up those, <laughs> those revenues there. Uh, we also attend, like I said earlier, major motor, motor co coach conferences uh, to promote Bristol to regional tour groups. And just in February, we already have 35 tours scheduled for this year, so we're anticipating a very, very big year for that. 
foundation for the future. So education, we have a lot of, a, a very massive education program. Um, as you can see with the, the list of things there, I'm not gonna go down the list and, and read each item, but I will say uh, that we do impact over 23,000 students and 1,300 teachers a year. And during COVID when we were shut down and, and couldn't open, we really were able to dive in deep to that and do webinars and do virtual learning programs and uh, lessons for, for teachers to use in their classroom with students to get them excited about what, where they come from. And that leads me into this. So I know when you think of birthplace of country music, you don't think, oh yeah, they're really, they're really making the neighborhoods a better place. Um, but one thing that we do is we instill community pride. And when people are proud of where they come from, they're more likely to invest time in it. They're more likely to want to make it even better. Um, and there's a lot of studies that show that community pride is directly correlated with pro-social behavior. So when people are proud of where they come from, they're more likely to volunteer, they're more likely to donate, they're more likely to share all the things that do help with a vibrant neighborhood. Um, another thing that community pride really impacts is tourism. It's a symbiotic relationship there. When people come to an area and they see that the people that are local love where they are, it makes the experience that, more that much more enjoyable for them. Um, and it also makes people who live here excited to share the place um, with tourists instead of having a negative outlook on it. Outstanding city services. Um, so one thing about our relationship with the city is I feel like we always try to share resources when we have them. Uh, we do a lot of work to try to improve the livelihood of citizens in Bristol. Uh, and one example of us making this relationship symbiotic and something that's good for you and good for us, like I said, is always sharing resources. Uh, we just received a grant where we'll be able to um, purchase a lot of bicycle fencing this year. And that's just one example of that, is that that'll be made available whenever needed, the same as any other resources that we have. So a healthy financial environment. Um, the vision booklet references growth and revenues resulting from a proactive development of the city's destination identity. Um, and this is referenced multiple times throughout the vision booklet and the comprehensive plan. And that is something that we are a driving force behind. Um, everything we do is to ensure that we are a great destination for people to come, whether that's promoting our own programs, promoting other attractions in the area, or partnering with other tourism groups. Uh, that is a, a very big priority of ours. Um, we're also directly supporting this with sales tax revenue through our museum admissions and concert tickets. Uh, we drive hotel occupancy and sales for downtown businesses. Uh, and like I said earlier, the economic impact from our festival is, is up in the millions. So, And here's just one small example of, of how we do this. Um, so this is Karen Hester with Cranberry Lane and Southern Turn, and, and she stated that you know during the festival it's their biggest sales weekend of the entire year. And that's a trend that we see throughout downtown Bristol. Another one of the the main priorities and goals is superb facilities and infrastructure. Uh, and I noticed in the vision booklet um, that it's discussed that one of the big parts of this is having an aesthetic cityscape. Uh, and just our museum alone contributes to this greatly. It's beautiful, it's a nice building, but not only is it just us, we're influencing other people to want to come here and revitalize downtown Bristol. And I'm sure you've probably seen this quote before or seen these pictures before. Um, but one example is the Bristol Hotel cited us directly as their reason that they wanted to come to downtown Bristol and, and invest over $20 million to, to make it better. Uh, and this is a second example. Um, another hotel that cited us directly as a reason that they wanted to come and help to revitalize downtown Bristol. So I wanted to touch a little bit on how we're funded. Uh, I know when you make an investment in something, you want to know that it's a wise investment and that it's sustainable. And we do a lot of work to ensure that we are sustainable. Um, you'll notice block five, we have government support at all levels. Uh, the national average for museums is around 24% for their income, comes from local government sources. Um, so it is 
incredibly important to our museum that we have that support. Um, for face value, obviously, you know, we need that revenue, but also it impacts other people's willingness to invest in us. When they are trying to figure out if we're in good investment, when they see that our local government supports us, it lets them know, okay, that is a good investment. Um, we have block one, which is basically our individual givers. So we have our 1927 society, uh, which is our giving society. We have our unbroken circle society, which is our cumulative giving. And we have our legacy society, which is for planned gifts. Block two, we have the Bristol Sessions Leadership Circle, which is local businesses and their investments in us. Our grants task force, which has grown tremendously over the last three years. Uh, and then we have the Bristol Sessions Super Raffle. Uh, so moving forward, our projective outcomes, we would like to continue BCM's proven positive impact on the city of Bristol. Uh, we plan to do that through any investment that's given to us to be able to increase our museum into attendance, increase our festival attendance, um, increase what we're able to do with education, uh, and to hopefully increase the visibility of farm and fun time all of which will actively contribute to the city of Bristol's vision for the future. When Ralph yeah. Peer comes here and has all his sessions, particularly with the Carter family and with Jimmy Rogers, that's the lightning striking twice, that's the big bang, that's the moment. He brought a revolutionary idea which has imprinted a legacy upon this town that will never die. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone with the council have any questions or, or comments? Um, I do have a, a couple of comments that will maybe lead into a question. Okay. Um, so, so obviously, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, I, I think that, you know, just as much as people think of Bristol for NASCAR, they think of Bristol for country music. And uh, I think it is a testament to the work you all do um, that, you know, we have got you know, we've got a return to farm and fun time, which was a thing 70 years ago on WCYB, I think. And, um, and now you've got a radio station that broadcasts far and wide. Um, you know, and, and I th I'm glad you mentioned, you had that little clip with Ken Burns. I was literally listening to a podcast the other day from some people in California, and they just brought up the Ken Burns country music documentary. It, it has far reaching effects and far reaching results. And, you know, people are coming to Bristol now. People don't. We, we were joking around before this, you know, people think of Nashville usually as country music, um, but Bristol is the birthplace of country music and people think of this now as, as the birthplace. So, so you all do a tremendous job and, uh, and we, we certainly appreciate you. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you and we are certainly blessed to have a gym like Birthplace of Country Music Museum here in Bristol. And I want to encourage people, if you have not gotten out and been able to go through and visit the museum, please do. It's an amazing experience. And I, I talk to people all the time that live right here in Bristol that's never been through the mu museum at all. So please go check it out if you have it. And thank you for that. It was beautiful. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll piggyback on that. Not only uh, check out the museum, uh, you know, which is open every day but Monday, and a festival, which I think most people <coughs> have been to, but some of the other programming you mentioned, and, and uh, my bone to pick is like tonight, they're having a very interesting discussion about uh, the kazoo. Yeah. And Thursday is, of course, Farm and Fun Time will be at the Fairmount, and we're here with council meeting and a budget meeting, so. Sorry uh, about that. That's all right. <laughs> but, but I mean, the point is that you do things throughout the year, and, and particularly the, the uh, Radio Bristol and that farm and fun time, I think, has a huge potential to make people aware of this region, its musical heritage, and hopefully make them want to come and visit. Uh, my one question, you, you mentioned about the group tours and stuff. Has, mm -hmm. <clears throat> have you seen kind of, I know last year, of course, things were closed for a while. Things were very slow, and and particularly with the group tours, I know it takes a lot of lead time to get those to come. But have you seen that those are starting, that group tours are starting to bounce back, and just attendance mm -hmm. in general is starting to to come back to where it 
was or, or getting close? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, we've got, um, already have 36 group tours scheduled for this year and that was, we've got, I think three or four more conferences that we're planning to attend in the early year to schedule even more later on. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work there to, to see those numbers increase and we've already seen a, a lot of people come in. We've got our Mountain Dew exhibit right now and that has been incredibly popular just in the short time that that's been open. So we're definitely trending up and we're really, really excited about that. Yeah, because, and, and Ms. Nave can definitely speak more to this, but I know in listening to these before, uh, those group tours, I don't think people quite realize just what that means to the community when you see that bus out there and, and the fact of now having two hotels da in downtown Bristol, mm -hmm. you know, that, that they're spending the night, they're, they're visiting the museum, they're eating downtown, they're shopping downtown. And so uh, that, that's really good to see. We're actually, um, so I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but there's gonna be a Mini Cooper uh, car. Are you, you got, you've, you're aware of this? A Mini Cooper car rally that's gonna be coming past Bristol. Um, so our tour person, our group tours person is actually in works right now trying to, to get them to stop by the museum and stop into Bristol and it's up to 2,000 individuals with Mini Coopers. So <laughs> we're excited about that. <laughs> well, uh, well, I just wanted to, to say thank you for coming here tonight and, and speaking with us and letting us know everything the museum is working on. So uh, we, we do appreciate it and yeah. thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your time. The, uh, the next person on the list is Discover Bristol. First off, thanks uh, for the time to present to you today. Uh, my name is Christopher Perrin. I'm the marketing director at Discover Bristol. And I first have to say I'm so glad to hear tourism mentioned so often uh, already in this evening's presentation, including the, the Many Takes the States event that uh, we helped recruit to bring here. So we're really excited about that as well. Uh, the presentation I presented to you, um, there's a little bit more information in there than what we're gonna go over today, so I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about that later on. I just really wanted to briefly put up what our mission statement is, uh, really to uh, have economic vitality in Bristol throughout the entire uh, season as a year-round travel destination. A little bit about uh, what, a, what is a DMO. Uh, we're the destination mar marketing organization uh, for the city of Bristol, Virginia. We're housed under the Bristol Chamber of Commerce, which is a five-star accredited uh, chamber. Partners and partnerships, um, that's what we're all about. Uh, we're really a convener. We want to help uh, all the hospitality and tourism organizations in the city of Bristol be successful, utilize all of them as a draw and a lure for people to come and visit our area. As I mentioned, it's, it's important just to understand our role. Uh, we really are working with all of our stakeholders um, to utilize them uh, within certain seasons or, or messages or buckets or something that attracts to certain personas as a way for people to come to Bristol uh, with the hopes of them staying overnight. Uh, these are going to be very difficult to read, but uh, we have several quotes from some of our stakeholders in Bristol that just talk about um, the importance of tourism and, and why we need to have those efforts here to help draw visitation into our communities and the impact that it has on their businesses. So what do we know and what do we believe? We know that um, tourists come and they visit places before they consider moving or establishing businesses. Um, that's a, a, a big lure or draw for Bristol in general, and we want to be able to have them come through um, the door of visitation and tourism first with the hopes that we can attract these people to move here. Tourism builds a visitor economy. Um, it's really built around um, the tourism experience, the things that are good for tourism and tourists are also good for residents. We all benefit uh, from a tourism and a visitor economy. Tourism improves the quality of place. 
uh, things that are established here uh, with the, the mindset or vision of making an, attractable, uh, an attractive place uh, for residents and for visitors. Um, everyone benefits from that infrastructure and vision that we're all trying to achieve. And, and tourism improves the overall quality of life that we have here in Bristol. This can be a winning proposition, tourism, uh, for so many uh, different segments here in, in Bristol. Um, the visitors, the residents, and the entire community can win uh, in this situation. It's something that uh, is mutually beneficial on different levels. Uh, the visitors, they, they win by just being able to experience all that Bristol has to offer. The residents win because tourism actually generates lodging tax and food and meals tax revenues that save our residents on their tax burdens. And the entire community wins, um, just generating the money that we've heard talked about this evening, and it helps generate uh, new jobs and businesses. Speaking to that, uh, we, we discussed um, the latest figures that we have is that through tourism spending, it helped lessen the tax burden for Bristol, Virginia residents by $653. Tourism actually saves our residents money. It generated $54 million um, to Bristol, Virginia's economy, and it also helps generate millions of dollars for um, state tax revenues as far and local tax revenues. And as I mentioned, it's a job creator. Over 700 jobs were generated through tour the tourism industry in Bristol, Virginia, and you can see that it also infuses wages uh, for our residents here in Bristol. Uh, I know that y'all have seen this before, but I just wanted to put this uh, in front of you as just far as what our strategic plan is, uh, but something that is new uh, for the immediate future, and it actually came from a VTC drive uh, grant, is what our strategic focus is uh, in the near term, and that really has a focus on engagement messaging and sustainability. This is a good example on why you don't see our ads. Um, Discover Bristol is promoting our city um, to outer markets uh, with the hope that the, the, the residents in these markets are going to visit Bristol uh, with the intent of staying overnight with an average of two to three nights. Here's our target audience personas. Uh, nothing should really surprise you here. Being the birthplace of country music, uh, we are targeting music lovers. Uh, outdoor recreation is a huge opportunity here for us motorsports fans, just with all the racing that we have to offer, including uh, having Bristol Motor Speedway in our backyard, and young professionals. Um, they're looking for things to do, weekend trips, just fun getaways. Um, wanting, it's all about experiences, and we feel like Bristol has so much to offer, and that's space. Here's a, a recap of just where we are with some of our own media channels. We leverage these a lot uh, when we don't have money for, for marketing and promotion campaigns. Uh, visitation to our website we saw grew uh, last year. Uh, it was up to 158,000 page views. Uh, our social media accounts continue to see growth. The one call out I want to have there is just our Facebook following. Uh, just to kind of give you some context, Visit Knoxville has about 116,000 followers, so we're on, on pace uh, with a large, large metro markets. So we can really leverage these audiences to be able to get in front of and share messaging uh, that doesn't necessarily have a cost. Um, having paid efforts behind it certainly helps, but also having a, a large base of followers uh, really allows us to extend our messaging uh, with what we've been able to build up. So what does success look like? Uh, our number one KPI that we continue to uh, target is just lodging tax collections. That's something that we talk about all the time. But some of our secondary metrics is website visitation, uh, visitor guide requests, and just social media engagement and account growth. Here is a breakdown of, of just what our lodging tax collections have been historically. Uh, we've had it broken out on just the Tennessee and Virginia side, and then what our contributions have been uh, or what we've received from a contribution standpoint. And as you can see, we're continuing to see growth uh, on the Bristol, Virginia side specifically, uh, but the amount of money that's being reinvested back into tourism and tourism promotion is continuing to, to decline. And uh, we worry that with the, the decreased amount of funding, it's going to stymie those efforts. Uh, we've got some good positive momentum that's going on, 
Um, we've been very blessed and fortunate to receive some federal funds, including CARES Act money, and we're, we're working on the ARPA money for the city of Bristol, Virginia, but those federal funds are not always gonna be there. So we gotta find other ways to be able to reinvest that money to make sure that we are bringing visitors back into Bristol. This uh, trend chart gives you a little bit of a better visual on what that looks like. Uh, we even saw uh, last year a, a bit of a rebound and we're gonna go into some hotel lodging uh, metrics here pretty soon that's gonna show an even positive outlook, but we wanna continue to see that line chart moving in an upward trajectory and we certainly feel like that's going to happen with the Bristol Hard Rock coming online soon. So the next three slides that we're gonna uh, look at are um, key lodging metrics. And the blue line is last year, uh, the gray line is an average of 2016 to 2019, and the green line is 2020, which is a little bit of an anomaly throwaway year. But as you can see uh, through these projections, this is the occupancy rate uh, percentage, how many hotel rooms are filled on a nightly basis. Uh, we are even outpacing uh, most of the year, the 2016 to 2019 uh, average. This is the average daily rate, which is how much people are paying to stay in a hotel room overnight. And this is the one that has the most significant growth. There were even times last year where uh, the average daily rate was over $20 more per night than it was during pre-pandemic levels. Um, so people are paying a lot more money to stay in the hotel rooms in Bristol, which is really what's helping drive um, those lodging tax collections. And this uh, chart is the, the REVPAR number, which really combines the average daily rate and the occupancy tax um, to put together how much money is being attributed to every single room uh, based on those calculations. Again, you can see the blue line is really uh, higher than uh, even the pre-pandemic levels the majority of the year. So we feel like we're starting to see some positive uh, trajectories that are coming out, even though we're still somewhat in a pandemic. Uh, but we feel like we're really poised to uh, see big growth here in the summer and winter. As I mentioned earlier, the visitor guide request is a piece that we really look at as uh, an intent. If people are requesting visitor guides, it's showing that they are really doing their due diligence and research and homework into visiting a potential destination. Uh, last year alone, we were up almost 1,200 visitor requ requests year over year. And that's purely just through uh, our website and through our um, front desk. We have visitor guys that are out throughout um, the, the greater North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and uh, Kentucky region through a distribution uh, outlet. But these are the people that are coming to our websites and they're specifically finding it and they're requesting the information. Wanted to give you a little bit of a, a snapshot on just uh, what our top performing um, social media posts and, and images look like. And I think the trend that you'll see here, these are the Instagram images and here are our Facebook posts, that it really shows the diversity of what we have to offer here in Bristol. Um, it's, it's including downtown, it's showing the outdoors, Bristol Motor Speedway, music, the casino. Uh, we have so many assets here to promote and market. Uh, we have conversations with people that are outside our area and they literally would swap places if they could have all the assets that we have. And we just wanna make sure that we're taking full advantage of those. Um, just to give you a couple of highlights on some of the things uh, that we did last year. The first one was in March. We, we held a virtual state line summit uh, for tourism. And we had over 70 attendees uh, that participated with us and included um, the top tourism executives on the, the state of Virginia and the state of Tennessee. And really uh, was an opportunity for us all to get together and talk, uh, learn about trends, how we can work together. There were breakout sessions as well and uh, received really high marks on that. People are extremely pleased with uh, the programming that we had and would love um, to have that on a more frequent basis. Um, so I feel like that was just a, another example of us being able to be collaborative, pulling people together and uh, really discussing all that is going on in the tourism space in general and in Bristol. Here's an example of the VTC Wonder Love campaign that we ran. Uh, this really was a focus on road trips and getting out and exploring uh, all that uh, the state of Virginia has to offer. And uh, these were some of the top performing ads that you uh, are seeing in front of you. Again, diverse, uh, we're, we're looking at the winery, the Mendota Trail, fly fishing. 
Uh, it really has something that we can offer to everybody. And we're really, we're targeting four key markets, uh, Atlanta, Washington, DC, Nashville, and Charlotte. Uh, we try to be very specific with the amount of money that we have to work with to not spread ourselves out too far. Um, but there certainly are other markets that we could take advantage of if the funding allowed. This is uh, through some of our PR efforts, uh, really just working with travel writers. Um, this was an article that uh, showed up in the Atlanta Magazine, Southbound Magazine. It's a quarterly publication, and it really was a feature story that talked about um, all there is to do in Bristol. And as I mentioned earlier, Atlanta is one of our key markets, and for us to have to pay to have advertising or promotion in a, in a publication like this, we simply couldn't afford. Um, so these are some of our efforts that we're working on the earn side to be able to still put Bristol out there in a more authentic way where people are actually writing stories and articles about things to do in Bristol. This is a, another great example of us being able to, to work together with all of our stakeholders, uh, really trying to be that collaborator, convener, um, that we had a Discover Bristol Winter Getaway promotion that we ran uh, last November, December. And we got a lot of our partners together um, that were willing to put together uh, an item or an experience or lodging um, to be able to send that out there for people to be able to come and explore and <coughs> discover what Bristol has to do, especially during the winter. That's one of our softest times from a lodging standpoint and um, just from an overall business, food and beverage tax collections as well. So that's a focus area that we want to be on is these shoulder months. Uh, really November through January, February, uh, really trying to lift that up and give that some additional attention. We were able to do that with this promotion. And uh, as you can see, we had entrance from, from over 23 states with a very minimal marketing and promotion budget. So it shows that people want to come and visit here um, even during uh, maybe non-peak times. This is a, a breakout or pie chart that just shows our uh, revenue sources this one would look uh, a little bit different this year, just based with some of the federal funding um, that we're anticipating coming in. But a, a great deal of our, our funding does come from um, the, the State Tourism Office or the City of Bristol, Virginia, with the additional uh, federal funding that's coming in this year. Again, uh, we're the, the marketing, destination marketing organization for the City of Bristol, Virginia. We are executing those services um, so that's the reason why you're seeing those revenues coming in because we are going back out to market all that Bristol has to offer. Uh, again, I'm just the only full-time person. You're hearing that a lot uh, this evening, but uh, we are, we're working off a 1.8 FTE model. So I have shared resources uh, within the, the Bristol Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the, the organization would not be successful without the entire team working on it. Uh, but I am the only full-time person that is working for Discover Bristol. This is the, a breakout of the expense model and uh, the, the city of Bristol, Virginia's piece of this pie uh, is getting bigger, uh, or the salaries from an expense standpoint, but the actual salaries for our organization has gone down. And the reason why you're seeing that is just because we have less money to work with that's the reason why the expense level is uh, taking a bigger piece of the pie, uh, just simply because the amount of funding that we're receiving is uh, going in the, the opposite direction. Um, so just a, a quick reminder on um, how the lodging tax collections, uh, the, intent, the intent is from the legislative standpoint, is that the, the money is collected, it's being remitted uh, back to the state and the city and the city turns around and, and funds um, tourism operations and efforts to go back out in the attempt to lure additional visitors back to our community. And uh, that is happening, but there's also a lot of the money that's being utilized to fund um, the general operations, uh, which we know that the city desperately needs. Um, that's part of the organization. We would just like to be able to see more of that money being infused back into tourism promotion efforts uh, because we do feel like tourism is an investment, it's not an expense. We put more money back into promoting our city, all that it has to offer. We're gonna be able to generate additional lodging tax collections and food and beverage uh, taxes. So why invest in Bristol's tourism economy? The number one thing uh, is that there is a, a, a legal uh, 
perspective, we have to invest in tourism. If the city is gonna collect lodging taxes, um, the money has to be reinvested back into tourism promotion. Uh, another big aspect, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting to get out of COVID, but there's so many of our hospitality and tourism businesses that are still feeling the effects. Uh, there's businesses that are fighting to stay open and operational every single day. Uh, there's a lot of jobs. Bristol's uh, hospitality and tourism industry is the number one job industry in, in the city. And we wanna make sure that that is a thriving area. We want to have things for visitors to do and our residents, quite frankly, to enjoy when they come to Bristol. Um, so that is another piece of this pie uh, on why we need to be supporting tourism. And uh, again, if we're bringing people back in to vis visit Bristol, it's an opportunity for us to lure additional re uh, residents. We need to increase our, our resident base here. Uh, we want to Im improve um, businesses um, that are coming in, uh, the amount, the quality of businesses, the quality of life, seeing what the employee, the employee has to experience outside those work hours, all that plays a role and we feel like tourism is kind of the top of the funnel for that experience. So uh, with some of the additional funding that we're requesting, uh, we want to be able to extend our marketing and promotional <laughs> efforts. We talked a little bit about um, those shoulder months, the November to February time period. We continue to hear that from our hoteliers and from our other stakeholders that that's the time that they need help the most, um, that we need to be able to pull people in during off peak time. So we want to be able to get messaging out in front of them. Uh, we really want to be able to um, go to some of these group travel expos as well. We've been able to work with BCM on being able to get some of our messaging out there. Um, they've been a great community partner. They certainly are taking the lead along with uh, Bristol Motor Speedway on going to a lot of these dr group travel conventions, but we would like to be able to help play a role in that as well. Um, but the money has to be there for us to be able to do that. And just in increased engagement uh, in the outdoor recreation space. Um, just this past Saturday, we hosted a Vancouver International Mountain Film Festival World Tour event at the Cameo Theater. Uh, we want to bring in unique programming. We want to be able to celebrate all that the outdoors has to offer, especially during the pandemic time period right now. It's kind of the safe thing that people are looking to do, or maybe they've even reconnected with the outdoors more um, since they've been pent up. And we have so many assets to have there. So we want to continue to double down on those efforts to be able to really put uh, the, the shine and spotlight on our outdoor assets. I just want to drive this point home again one more time, just showing what tourism does for the city of Bristol, Virginia. Tourism saves Bristol residents money on their tax burden. Tourism generates uh, money into Bristol, Virginia's economy. Tourism generates sales tax revenues on the state and local level. Tourism generates jobs uh, for the residents of Bristol, Virginia, and it also provides wages to those workers. Tourism is an investment, it is not an expense. I hope that we can continue to look at it through that scope, that the money that is being invested into tourism activities and promotional efforts, you're going to receive a return on that investment. Again, our vision is to be one of the most visited and talked about travel destinations in the Southeast, but we have to be able to have financial funding to be able to tell that story. We have all the assets, we have everything that is going to lure people in, but if we can't tell that story to people that are outside this region, it doesn't do us any good. So I do wanna thank you all just not only for tonight, but all the continued efforts and the partnerships that you have provided for us. It has been greatly appreciated. We're looking forward to continuing that conversation. And again, if we all pull together and we're working hand in hand, that's where we're gonna see the biggest lift and impact. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, are there any questions or comments from anyone on the council? I just have a couple of comments. Thank you so much, um, Christopher. The work that you're doing through Discover Bristol um, is extremely important. As you stated multiple times in your presentation, tourism is an instant revenue generator for our city. And um, while we don't see it just every day, it, it's the money that's coming into our city that we put back into, that's where we pay for things for our fire and our fire department, police department, you know, our schools. It's across the board, not just tourism. So um, thank you for that presentation. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And as we move forward, 
you know, in thinking forward, we've got a lot of um, economic development happening in our city. And tourism is the front door for that. Before someone uh, comes here, moves their company here, they come to visit first. So we've got to have that red carpet rolled out and be ready for them. So thank you. I do have a couple questions. Um, so in your, um, in your request packet, um, you have a goal for increasing the visitors to the museum, at least 50% of which will be tourists. Um, and it says projected results, visitors from outside 24201 zip code. Um, how far out, are we counting like 37620 is outside the 24201 zip code? Not, not necessarily. I mean, people look at tourism in different aspects. I mean, yes, if people are coming to visit and they're, they're utilizing the space for entertainment, it is tourism, but uh, we're really looking at those outer markets. That's where we're trying to have the impact. We're trying to bring people in. Uh, the majority of them are gonna be within a drive. Uh, we are seeing some air travel um, that's picking up a little bit, but really, as you can tell from Charlotte, Atlanta, Nashville, and Washington, DC, those are all drive markets, but it's far enough away to where they should stay at least one evening. Uh, we are seeing increased visitation in markets like Asheville and Knoxville just because people are looking for day trips, um, but we're really trying to even get outside that space um, to really be able to have those overnight stays. And I think certainly Knoxville, Asheville, Roanoke, those are reasonable you know, expectations, but it, if you have some type of breakdown that you may, might be able to provide to us that shows exactly, you know, because you know, I don't think of Abingdon or Johnson City coming to Bristol as, as really tourists, you know, those, those are still local people. So if you have some kind of breakdown of that, that might be helpful. Um, okay. The other question I had, so you talked about targeting people who are in that two to six hour um, drive time, Washington DC, Atlanta. So are most of these um, like social media driven advertisements or, or are you literally like taking out ads on buses or, or radio, you know, what, what's the, the method of communication to these people? The majority of it is digital, um, to, be, to be quite honest with you. Uh, traditional, I think, could have a place in some of these efforts, but traditional is extremely expensive, uh, especially when we're talking about the markets that we are discussing. Uh, quite frankly, Charlotte might be the only one that we could have um, traditional advertising in that we could afford. Um, digital allows us to be extremely targeted um, from not only a locality standpoint, but maybe it's from a, a demographic or a persona standpoint that we're really trying to target certain audiences. Uh, you can do that much easier with digital and it also allows you to optimize if you're seeing maybe Charlotte's not performing and Nashville is giving you a 3x return you can turn Charlotte off and put that money into Nashville you can't really do that with traditional once you've spent the money in the ad runs that's it um, but we really don't even have the money to run a lot of these um, traditional ads so uh, paid social uh, digital banner ads paid search ads retargeting ads that's really the space that we have to live in. I feel very strongly about that space, generally speaking, but we're also kind of backed into that corner to where that's really the only space that we can afford to be. I guess I, I said that was my last question, but I think I have one more. Sure. So um, back in your presentation on the, um, on the graph showing monthly, uh, monthly occupancy in hotels, mm -hmm. um, Consistently from 2016 to now, it, it appears that January, February are the weakest months uh, for Bristol. And, you know, I understand that it's very cold. Nobody wants to go on vacation when it's snowing and blowing. Um, so I know you, you address in your uh, funding request packet ideas for how to address that. I think you talked about it here too. Um, are you fairly confident that you think you can, can improve the January, February numbers? Because that, that's been a consistent weakness for, for the city of Bristol. We've seen uh, before my time that they had concerted efforts towards that time period and they were able to impact uh, those months. Now, uh, to what extent and how, how much, I think we really have to test and, and see what's possible. Um, our latest VTC grant applications that we just put in, uh, one was specifically talking about winter uh, as our promotional time period that we want to get out there. The other one is actually from September to March and it really has a focus on events that we are uh, wanting to promote to attract visitors here. 
Um, so we certainly feel like it's a, it's a valuable uh, exercise to go through. But again, one of those pieces that we have with uh, the digital advertising and marketing, if we feel like we're not seeing the results that we typically get, it's something that we could pause and have discussions about and see if that's still the best approach. But I think at some point we have to find ways to make those months more attractive. They're not gonna be on the same uh, wavelength as when we're having NASCAR events or the Rhythm and Roots Festival. But uh, if we can have a little bit less peaks and valleys to where all of our businesses, including the hoteliers, can have a more consistent funding model where they know uh, that there should be revenues coming in, I feel like we all can win there. Um, so that's why, uh, based on the feedback that I'm hearing from stakeholders, that's where they want help. Uh, we feel like we can attack that and move the needle. If we feel like uh, the results are not where we want them to be, then we certainly can pivot and put that money into other areas. That was my last question. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, just say thank you for the presentation. It's always good to hear uh, the work you're doing and, and from um, some of the forecast for the budget next year, listening to uh, um, <coughs> Maggie talk about Believe in Bristol and what's going on downtown and Shauna talk about the birthplace of country music. You can start to see uh, that, that some of the things that, that were really hard hit over the last year or two during, because of the pandemic are starting to come back. And, and I think, you know, we're positioned, as, as you mentioned, with a, a lot of great assets to move forward. Um, and, and we really need to look at that, how we move forward, because I think we got some, some good things on the way as well. And uh, as you pointed out, and, and I've said that as well, that it really is, it's not an expense, it's an investment. And we've had discussions about what that level of investment should be and, you know, different philosophies on that. Uh, but I do think, um, you know, that we have a good opportunity right now to get our, our market, our city. And, and uh, uh, so I appreciate the work you're doing and also appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of the work you do, you focus particularly on the businesses that are actually not necessarily the, the CVB, but the actual businesses that are uh, doing the work. They're the ones that are out there. They're the ones that are, are, are making uh, the thing. And a lot of times they don't have the resources to market themselves to, to people that are, are, are in the community, sometimes let alone out, you know, 100 miles, 200, 300 miles away to know they even exist. So um, with that, and, and my one question is, because those industries, uh, particularly the, the hotel, arts and entertainment, were some of the hardest hit during the, the pandemic. Um, and you showed how the occupancy and the rev revenue, rev rev par, is really kind of bounced back, uh, in some ways even exceeded where the, the average was. Is that pretty, uh, from what you've been able to gather, are we in line with what other communities are doing? Is, are we kind of, have we bounced back stronger? Or wh how do we fall compared to, to other localities? It ebbs and flows a little bit. Uh, Becky actually sent an email, I believe it was in September of uh, this past year. Um, there obviously we have the, the music festival and we have NASCAR races in September, but um, the, the key lodging metrics that you see, the uh, occupancy rate, the average daily rate, we are actually the number one uh, city or market in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, so there's certainly times uh, where we're really performing well and um, there's other times where uh, maybe some of these larger markets are starting to rebound. Um, they were the ones that were probably behind on the pandemic that were shut down a little bit, that they're starting to see a, a resurgence. But when you're really talking about a comp set uh, for similar markets for us, uh, we're, we're performing right on their level, if not exceeding. And I, I feel really good about the historical trends that we're seeing that we're already over uh, pre-pandemic levels. The average daily rate, a $20 increase and in a stay per night for every room, that's really encouraging. We just gotta get more people into those hotel rooms. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight and speaking with us. We, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, 
next group on our list is Communities in Schools of Southwest Virginia. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Brett Davis. I'm a Bristol, Virginia resident. I'm Director of Development for Communities in Schools of Southwest Virginia. Thank you, Mayor Farnham, uh, City Manager Eads, and City Council Councilors for this opportunity to speak. Communities in Schools is the nation's leading community-based organization helping kids stay in school and prepare for life. As an independent affiliate of that national organization, our mission is to, to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. <clears throat> we ensure that every student, regardless of socioeconomic status or background, has what they need to realize their potential. Working directly in 36 schools throughout Southwest Virginia, our site coordinators connect students to caring adults and community resources that help them see, confront, and overcome barriers. The result, teachers are free to teach and students have the opportunity to focus on learning. We work on all the issues that so many students face outside of the classroom so that they can take full advantage of what's happening inside of the classroom. In the United States, about 14 and a half million kids under age 18 are living in poverty. Here in Southwest Virginia, about 74% qualify for free or reduced lunch within our schools, with 89% of Bristol, Virginia public school students qualifying for free or reduced lunch. Some of the circumstances tied to poverty which make students more at risk of dropping out include inadequate health care, homelessness, and unstable families, just to name a few. In the United States, every 25 seconds, a student drops out of school, and this is typically a result of a long process of disengagement, not a single event. School dropouts are four times more likely to be unemployed, twice as likely to live in poverty, more likely to depend on welfare, and more likely to face chronic illness. At-risk students need us to do whatever we can to help them break down barriers, whether it's food insecurity or the need for a positive adult relationship. Relationships are at the root of everything that we do. What sets us apart from other organizations is that our site coordinators are placed in the school to build those relationships. Relationships with teachers, relationships with their uh, school staff, relationships with parents, and of course, relationships with students. We work on building students' social, emotional, and ac academic competencies. We work to improve their attendance behavior and to get them promoted to the next grade level keeping them on path towards graduation. We also work to prepare students for college or a career, whatever their path may be. Though we're a dropout prevent prevention organization, the work begins at elementary schools. <clears throat> if we can build good habits and healthy relationships in younger students and then continue that work through middle and high school, they're much more likely to graduate and be prepared to take on life's challenges. Our model of integrated student supports is all about leveling the playing field by making sure that all students have access to community resources and tools that they need to unlock their potential. That work starts with our student support specialists or site coordinators who work at schools where we serve. And if you'll notice in the graphic, that's the uh, individual with the blue shirt in the top left corner and then located throughout the graphic. These site coordinators become an integral part of the school faculty. They conduct needs assessments and create support plans and then connect those plans with resources within the community. Because they work in the school building, 
Our site coordinators are able to identify needs and barriers in real time and then respond to those challenges rapidly and effectively. In Southwest Virginia, there aren't as many community resources ready to support our schools and students as you may find in larger cities. And so our team has been very creative in tackling our students' challenges by mobilizing volunteers, <coughs> faith-based communities, and other individuals who are willing to support. Along with targeted individualized supports for at-risk students, we also provide supports for whole school or supports that any student can access. These include attendance incentive programs, basic needs supports, and parent-family engagement events and programs. We provide our most at-risk students with trauma-informed supportive guidance and counseling, social emotional learning support, academic support, fluency interventions, opportunities to volunteer within the community, college application assistance, community-based mentoring, career and college exposure, parent engagement and education opportunities, and referrals to agencies for mental health, physical health, behavioral health, or other basic support needs. Because we are an independent nonprofit, we can meet the needs of our students quickly, often without a lot of red tape. If we can help, we will. By building the relationships with you, with the community at large, with our schools, with our students, and with our parents, we know that we can improve outcomes for our most vulnerable students. So, now that you've had a chance to hear about our model and how we do our work, I wanted to provide provide a few details about our local affiliate <coughs> and how the work we're doing is impacting the students throughout Southwest Virginia and here in Bristol. As I mentioned a moment ago, we're an independent affiliate of communities and schools, meaning that we completely govern ourselves and are also, also wholly responsible for raising the funds necessary to sustain our work. This, means, this also means that any resource invested into communities and schools in Southwest Virginia stays right here within Southwest Virginia. In 2013, we had two site coordinators serving two schools in Bristol. Now in the current school year, we have 26 site coordinators serving 36 schools across a region that includes Bristol, Dickinson County, Norton, Smith County, Tazewell County, and Washington County. These jobs are, require post-secondary education and are attracting young professionals to stay here in the area. In total, we'll provide individualized case management to over 1,200 students and reach more than 12,000 students through whole school programming this school year. In Bristol specifically, our goal is to case manage 300 students and provide whole school programming for 2,000 322 individual students. Here at the halfway point of the school year, we have already exceeded those goals in Bristol <clears throat> and the work continues every day. Our funding strategy allows us to provide services at no cost to these students. As a precedent, we do not initiate services within a school without some level of buy-in from the school division. In many cases, schools will provide half of the overall cost of a site coordinator, and this means that we must rely on grant funding, foundation support, donations from individuals and businesses, contributions from churches and civic organizations, and support from the cities and counties where we are working in order to bridge the gap. And yes, we are requesting funds from the other cities and counties that we are serving. Just as we surround our students with a community of support, a community of support can help move our organization forward and to grow and to serve more students. According to the results of a study conducted by Economic Modeling Systems Incorporated, which is an independent agency, Communities and schools dropout prevention and intervention programs have meaningful economic and societal, societal impacts. 
students benefit by making more money over their lifetimes, which is a result of their educational persistence, made possible by the value add of having CIS, the CIS model of integrated student services in their school. Businesses benefit by having a more skilled and productive workforce. Taxpayers benefit through a broadening of the tax base, and the public in general benefit from the reduced social costs such as crime, alcoholism, drug abuse, and unemployment. If you look at all the, uh, the different tourism things that Bristol's focused on now, um, we can really help empower the workforce of tomorrow to help those businesses that we're working so hard to promote. Uh, we're in schools to help kids stay in school and later in achieve in life. Uh, we appreciate all of you for allowing us your time uh, to tell, uh, tell you about what we are, what we like to do, and we appreciate your consideration <coughs> for our funding request. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Are, are there any comments or questions from the council? I'll go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. I appreciate it. Uh, having uh, children that have been at the elementary, middle, and now the high school level, I, I, I can see the importance of the services you provide, the supportive services. And I would agree when you say that the site coordinator works as a team. I mean, it, it's a seamless thing, the, the way they work with the faculty and, and uh, administrators in, in each of the schools. Um, my question was for when it comes to the um, amount of, of funding you requested, is that somehow based on a per pupil served kind of a formula or is it just the the needs that the organization has. I would say that our organization is funded, we have a 44% 40, of our funding is coming from schools, 44% is coming from, a, from grants and foundation support, and then that leaves about 12, 10 or 12% that needs to come from individuals. Um, we would lump this into that 10 to 12%. Uh, to have the community really stand behind us and, and support us. So as far as the, the dollar amount, and does that specifically align with any specific thing? No, it's just uh, we would like investment from the city into the services that we're providing. And that it's, it, it equates to, in terms of requests to other cities and counties, it does equate to the number of site coordinators that we are providing in those areas. Um, so that, is that, does that answer your question? Thanks. Well, we just, again, we want to say thank you. I agree with Mr. Hartley. You all do great work and you all do very important work in our school system. I know the school system can attest to that and, and the folks I've met with the communities and schools have been, have been great and they're dedicated and, and what they do. If, if there's no further questions, we do appreciate you coming this evening. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. So. The next folks on the list was Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia. And they're on Zoom tonight. Absolutely. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. I appreciate you all letting me Zoom in tonight. Uh, so that I can stay close to family and kids and all that wonderful stuff. I'm zooming in from Roanoke, uh, where our base is, that we do have community services, case management services there in Bristol. Uh, let's see here. Do we have our presentation? Yep. All right. Uh, not sure how to change slides virtually. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. Our basic min our mission is to better the lives of survivors, uh, children and adults, survivors of brain injury. And we improve their lives through improving their quality of lives and also helping reintegrate them back into their family and then also back into community following uh, injury, which often involves a trip to a hospital. You can zoom along to the next one up. Let's actually, no, you're right on the right one. So there's our history. We started about 20 years ago uh, by couple of parents who had a child who had a brain injury and realized there was a complete lack of services for folks who have had a brain injury. 
Uh, the hospital, they found decent services, but once they came home, they felt like there was a huge void and in order to fill that void, they created Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia. Uh, next slide, please. We started out in New River Valley and Roanoke and have since grown throughout all of Southwest Virginia, as you can see there by the map, including the lovely city of Bristol. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we serve folks who have had a traumatic brain injury and a non-traumatic brain injury. This includes folks who may have had a car accident, who have fallen, uh, may have been a victim of domestic violence or struck by a foreign object. Also includes folks who have had strokes, seizures, tumors, uh, and other non-traumatic brain injuries. All right, uh, next slide, please. Ah, oh, there, you're at the right one. So the need, so in the US, brain injury occurs every 20 seconds. In Virginia, one in 30 don't just have a brain injury, one in 30 have a disability because of a brain injury. So we cover 14,000 square miles, over 50 county cities and towns. Uh, so there are about 40,000 possible participants for our programs. In Bristol, it's about 500 possible participants. Uh, and we're ser currently serving five, so we would like to uh, grow. <laughs> There's a need and we would like to grow. Uh, as I mentioned, services are usually good in a hospital, though when survivors get home, they often find there's a lack of services or they don't know what the services are and there's not, no sort of connection to help them find the services. Uh, part of having a brain injury is losing your brain function and your ability to search for services. So not only do they not know, but they it's a challenge just to go looking for services. Uh, we do have a brief little video here we can share about how we work. Next slide, please. Uh, so the way our case management works is uh, it's community case management. So our case managers are matched up with a survivor and they actually go to that survivor's home to serve them. So they're not reliant upon transportation or other people or other ways of getting places. We go into their homes and we work directly with them. Uh, as we start to serve them, our case managers identify the, the areas of need, which can be anything from finding independent living, finding ways to, to be independent, uh, financial support. We've had uh, consumers, we've had participants who have needed help, wanted to do therapeutic horseback riding. We helped them find it. And then we also helped fund it for them so that they could pay for it. Uh, we've helped folks find living in apartment complexes that are adapted for individuals with disabilities. Uh, we've helped find funding for everything from pots and pans to home furnishings. Uh, we also connect people with rehabilitative therapies as needed, uh, school supports. For children, we do offer IEP supports, uh, social partnerships. We can help find transportation as needed, which can be anything from local transportation to, we've had churches that have partnered with us. Um, we, we, <laughs> we'll find it wherever we can. 
to, to make sure we get folks out into the community. Uh, so, so case managers meet with survivors, uh, they identify these needs, and then they, they work on establishing their goals and meeting these needs. And we have been fortunate enough to uh, meet over 80% of our, our participants, our survivors' goals uh, through this method. Yeah. See here. Next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned, over 80%. Uh, the individual on the left there uh, had an operation, was reliant upon his family living at home, but really wanted his own space and to live on his own. And our case manager, after a lot of work, was able to find an apartment complex that would accommodate him. Uh, also found funding to help provide furniture and things that he needed for his apartment, was able to get him out on his own and being uh, independent. Uh, on the right is a young lady who needed a power chair. She had a, as the parents mentioned, uh, manual chair that they were pushing, but they weren't getting around as much and as easy as she could when she was able to find funding and be able to get her power chair. Uh, to your next slide, please, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Over 60% of our participants fall below the poverty line with about 90% falling below 200% of the poverty line. Uh, for us, our expenses cost about 3,500 per person per year to provide these services. Uh, we do receive a good amount of funding through the state, but it's not enough to fully fund us. Uh, it also doesn't give us that buffer that when we need to help provide immediate support, whether it's food, or a rent check or something like that. Uh, they don't help us with that. And so we do ask uh, for donations from folks. We, were, we apply for grants and we do apply to localities. We apply to everyone we're in and we expect, uh, last year we got around $33,000 from the localities, from all of them. Uh, you know, many small increments that, that really help make a difference to, to support us. Fortunately, through all that funding, we are able to offer our services completely free of charge to our participants. Uh, so regardless of income, we, we are happy to serve and we're able to do it free of charge. Yeah. And, and that briefly sums up who we are and what we do. I'm happy to answer other questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? Um, I, I do have one question, uh, Mr. Barge. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, I, I, this question is more um, related to your to your funding overall. Um, mm -hmm. I see you're, you're a DARS funded agency, which is the Department of Aging and Rehabilitation Services. Um, yes, sir. And, and I have some familiarity with organizations that have been funded through that. So I see you all had received an increase for FY 2022. Is, is, that, did, yes, is that directly tied to like the CARES Act money or? Or do you, are you, do you anticipate uh, a, a reduction in that funding in the next couple of years? Uh, we, we don't foresee a reduction in that funding. Um, we allocated that to try and start a program called uh, Community Support Services, uh, which goes in and trains survivors. Uh, so if they needed help learning how to cook, learning how to shop, learning how to balance a budget, uh, and, and just basically getting back into living after their injury, uh, we, we've used that funding to help start that, uh, and we, we are slowly making our way throughout the state with that program, and we hope to grow grow that eventually down to Bristol, yes, sir. Well, thank you for all the work you all do, and uh, and thank you for your presentation to us. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. I, I'm happy. I'm sad I wasn't able to join you in person. Other questions. All right. Well, we uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight via Zoom and uh, protect, uh, presenting this information to us about the services you all provide. So if, if there's no further questions, I just want to say thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you all for letting me chat. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Okay. That's the last person presenting on this agenda item. Before we move on, we will take a quick five-minute recess. Just, it may take Gene longer to pull my slide up than it does for me to do the presentation. Maybe not.
So uh, last, uh, earlier in the, well, it, it, a few weeks ago, I shared this budget presentation with our school board, and our school board will be acting on this in the very near future. Um, uh, just to give you a, a, a budget schedule, the budget I'll share with you tonight is based on Governor Northam's budget that he released in December. Uh, the House and the Senate both released their budgets on February the 20th. I presented this, our budget on the 21st using the governor's number because we still don't know where the conference budget will end up. Obviously tonight I'm presenting to you guys. Our board will vote to approve the budget next at our meeting on Monday. Uh, sometime late March, and that, that actually may be um, wishful thinking, the way things are going right now with the budget in Richmond, it may be a little after that, but typically we could plan on seeing a conference budget coming out in, in late March, but we'll wait and see. Obviously, uh, our, our final budget is due to the city by March 31st. If the state does not approve their conference budget, we may be using some numbers that, that change as the, the rest of the spring goes on. There are, are pretty significant differences in the House, the Senate budget, actually we would get more money than what the governor recommends, and in the House budget we would get a significant, a significant amount, almost, well, two and a half million dollars less in the House budget if that budget is approved. Obvious, it, it will probably be some mix in between those two budgets, but we'll just have to wait and see how that, all that falls out. And of course, then you're, you're, um, you're, we will implement our budget on July, July 1st if the Commonwealth has approved their budget. So I want to start out the presentation tonight by talking about required local effort. And I think by the end of the presentation, you'll understand why I start the presentation this way. Uh, the state calculates the total cost it takes to operate a school division based on minimum standards set by the Virginia Department of Education. You've probably heard those called the standards of quality. I refer to them as the standards of mediocrity. Uh, but that's for an argument for another day. The, the total cost, after they figure out what the SOQs are, that total cost is then split between the state share and the local share. And they use an index based on really three things, property values, gross income, and, and local sales tax that are generated. And, and those three numbers give the state a composite index to look at. Bristol's composite index just happens to be 30, and that basically means that the city is responsible for paying for 30% to fund those standards of quality. The state funds those other 70%. Uh, the local share, according to the governor's budget, for next year is almost $7.2 million. That is the minimum the city has to provide in order to fund education uh, in the city of Bristol, Virginia. Now, if the Senate budget is approved, that number goes up to about $7.4 million, just $7.3 million. The House, the House version stays the same, even though they significantly decrease the amount of state funding they give, they really leave the local amount basically the same. So really, at the end of the day, um, if our enrollment holds, this is the minimum amount that the city will have to provide for public education in fiscal year 23, or 23 yes. As you know uh, from memory, that's a significant amount more than what um, you've been given in, in recent years. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So if you go back to 2017, um, the, your appropriation to the schools was $6.9 million. However, you were only required to give about 4.8 at that time. So in 2017, when I first got here, you were given about $2 million more than you were required to give by state law. And I won't read all those numbers down there uh, for you, but then if you go all the way down to 2023, um, the, your appropriation, we're requesting $7.6 million. That's an increase of about $854,000 from what you're given this year. Or, and then the, um, and the, you're required to give the 7.2. So that still only puts you about $440,000 above the legal required minimum. And as you can see, even though you would be giving us about $800,000 more than you were in 2017, you're just exceeding the minimum uh, by about 400,000 when you were doing about five, four times that much uh, in 2017. And so to do a quick budget summary, these, these accounts are carryoverable. These are our best guess. The, we have to ha adopt these numbers. Uh, our school nutrition fund is self-sustaining. It funds itself. Our textbook fund is, we are able to carry that over and our local capital projects. The expenditures may change, but the revenue, they will not go over the, the amount of revenues that we have in those accounts. If you look at our general fund, um, <clears throat> our state revenue is 
in 21 was 16.6 million. In fiscal year 23, it's going to be 18.3. That's a $1.7 million increase based on the governor's budget. And that is the non-restricted use. The restricted use state revenues is going to go up by about $2.2 million. Our federal revenue will go down by about $2 million. And that is really just because that CARES money is going off the books. We still have some, we're not getting any new ESSER monies, but we have spent out most of our CARES money and a good portion of our ESSER II funds. Uh, local revenue, um, asking for an $855,000 increase and no, di no difference in our other revenue. So for a total general fund revenue, <coughs> budget of 47.8 or almost 0.9 million and a in total increase of $2.7 million. Uh, our expenditures will match up with that. Uh, a majority of that will be spent on instruction, which is basically our, our teacher and administrator and our uh, teacher assistant salaries and benefits. Uh, and then the, the next biggest portion of that will be $1.3 million or $7.5 million uh, in facilities with $1.3 million of that being an increase. For, uh, and again, our, our revenues and our expenditures do match. And so that takes us on to our, the capital needs that we have. You know, we are at very close to uh, consolidating three of our oldest elementary schools and building a new intermediate school on the property at Van Pelt. That's going to take a huge uh, chunk of our capital needs off of our capital improvement plan list. Uh, we still have some things out there that we just want to keep on the table to make sure we're talking about so that there are no surprises if these things do come up. Uh, we have an elevator that needs to be replaced at the high school. We have some painting that we need to be doing at, at some of our schools. As we build the new school, the intermediate school, we still, we've started the renovations on the existing Van Pelt to close those open classrooms down. And so we still have that waiting on us. We try to take care of a school bus every, every year. And then we also, uh, we've been doing our own custodial work for several years now and it's time to replace some equipment. And then with the energy performance grant, we are, um, we are gonna move forward with that. It, it, the prices keep going up on, not only on that project, but on other projects that we're doing. So we may have to make some adjustments to the energy performance contract. Uh, and so we may not be able to, right now we have about $4 million of slated projects that are, uh, need to be done there. We may or may not be able to do all of those. So some, whatever's left off of that list would still remain on our capital improvement plan. And so in, in conclusion, just, you know, I don't, I want to make sure that we leave this meeting tonight uh, with nobody thinking that our, the school system is being unreasonable with this significant increase in our request to the city. Uh, that increase is, is required by the state of Virginia. And if you look at, at this chart, it really shows, you know, just when you look at the amount of appropriation, it's been relatively level in the previous four years. It does go up uh, a, a good deal in this year. But as you look at our, the amount above required local effort, you can see that that has went down since 2017. And so it's, and it will be, you know, we're trying to, the reason that we gave the budget request of $7.6 million is just to keep that amount above required local effort exactly where it was last year. That's still a pretty tight cushion. Um, you know, if we have a, you know, enrollment increase because the casino opens up, that could cause that to go up as well too. So anyway, that was the reason that we made that request. And I do want to, if you hear nothing else that I said tonight, to make sure that you understand that we're not making an unreasonable request for an increase in our local funds. It is gonna be required by the state, regardless of which budget is approved. With that, it may be the shortest presentation I've ever made to city council, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions which may make it go longer. I hate to jinx the shortest, and I'm sure that is the shortest presentation I've heard. But I will ask one. Uh, you talked about the capital needs, and, and as you're talking about where your money would go, uh, Facilities. Yes, sir. Was that include? Was the capital included in that? Because I know it jumped up quite a bit. Uh, or is the is that something else for the facilities? The capital well, you just had the list there, and it's like uh, you know, part of the money was going to personnel, and then it said facility. Yeah, right there, facilities. Would that include the capital?
I, that's why I was trying to get a sense of, you know, of course, with the, the instruction, I can see where what's driving that, right. what was really driving that number. Right. Yeah, and that's what it is. And that, num that same amount, it's about $1.8 million for the city of Bristol that we can use for any infrastructure that we have. It could even be used for uh, debt service on the new school moving into the future. We can carry that money over. That amount is in the Senate version of the budget. It is zeroed out in the House version of the budget. Delegate O'Quinn has uh, put a, a bill in that would allow us to get a rebate on the loan uh, that will be taken on the new school, and it, it could be up to as much as 30% of that total loan amount if that version is approved, but who knows. Just, just one question. This is kind of a, a big picture question. How's the school system doing with hiring and retaining because we talked a little bit earlier in our budget goals about city employees we were talking some about landfill employees and and law enforcement and those types of positions but we were we we're curious about it, how's the school system doing with that with with hiring and, and with not just uh, say teachers that are on a salary but but the non-teachers that are hourly yes employees. sir so Teacher-wise, we are one of the few school divisions who have been able to uh, have all of our teaching positions filled. Now, as the course of the year, we've had a teacher transfer to another position and have to fill that position, and we are currently trying to fill one special education position. But otherwise, all of our teaching positions are filled, and I think that is because in southwest Virginia, south of the New River Valley, we have one of the most competitive salary scales in all of southwest Virginia. We, I can throw a rock across the street, and it's very different. Uh, we do lose some of our teachers to Bristol, Tennessee and Sullivan County because they, they are able to pay more. But in, in greater Southwest Virginia, our teacher salary scale is, at, at most steps on the scale, we are in the top five, if not the very top. Uh, as far as our hourly employees, we are making significant adjustments to how we're paying our hourly employees. We've already made some adjustments already as we've prepared for an increase to the minimum wage. Uh, we know that Future increases are coming as well, and we're having a hard time keeping bus drivers and cafeteria workers and, and those things. So we are making significant changes to the way that we pay our hourly employees as part of this budget as well. But we, uh, if we do have positions that are unfilled, it's in those areas. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions for Dr. Perigen? Hearing none, we. Appreciate you coming tonight. We appreciate the report and the information. Thank, Thank you. The next item of our agenda, item three, approval of the professional auditing services contract. There was one person that signed up for public comment for this item. That was Michael Pollard. Thank you, members of the council and staff. Uh, just have one question. Um, I noticed that there, uh, the uh, posting date and the due date was only two weeks apart. Is that customary? It just seems that that's a fairly short period of time for a proposed um, applicant to get all the paperwork in. Okay. We'll see if we can if we can answer that in the um, staff report. Thank you, Michael. Staff report. Mayor and members of council, thank you. This item is the approval of the professional auditing services contract. A request for proposals for professional auditing services was issued February 1st, 2022, with proposals to be submitted on or before February 15th, 2022. The request for proposals included services for the city of Bristol, Virginia, Bristol, Virginia Public Schools, and Bristol, Virginia Industrial Development Authority. Three responses were received. Interviews with offerers were conducted Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 by a review committee con consisting of myself, the city CFO, the city senior accountant, and the CFO for Bristol, Virginia Public Schools. After the interviews were concluded, the, re the review committee ranked member members ranked the offerers and co competitive negotiations began with the offerer ranked number one, Robinson Farmer Cox Associates, on Tuesday, March 1st, 2022, an agreement was reached with Robinson Farmer Cox Associates. 
fees for the professional auditing services for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 22 are as follows. City audit fees, $56,000. School board audit, um, $35,200. IDA audit fees, $12,000. And school activity funds audit fees of $12,000. Fees for subs subsequent years will increase 3% annually. And to answer Mr. Pollard's question, um, we normally, um, we're only required to keep um, proposals out there, RFPs out there for 10 days. We typically do two weeks unless there is a time constraint that needs us to limit that down to 10 days. But that is what we're required to do by, okay. the, by the state code. So staff recommends that council approve the award of the professional auditing services contract to Robinson Farmer Cox Associates for the fiscal years ending June 30th, 2022, 2023, and 2024 with possible renewal option for two additional one year periods. And I would like to, I forgot to say this earlier, I would like to thank um, our purchasing specialist, Ms. Vicki Warren, for facilitating this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradlin. So what is the pleasure of the council? Uh, I move for the approval of the professional auditing services contract with Robinson Farmer and Cox Associates. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Is there a council discussion? I do have one question for, uh, Ms. Bradlin, um, and I understand why all these, uh, the school board, the IDA, all of that is with this because they're component units of our audit, but do the, will the school board and the IDA also have to approve this contract? No, because they're component units, they can follow our contract. Okay. 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 If there's no further discussion, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. Okay. The next item of our agenda is a second reading of an ordinance to create a zoning map amendment for property located at 2016 Veda Drive. Nobody okay. signed up for public comment. Staff report. Uh, council, before you is the second reading of the ordinance to create a zoning map amendment for property located at 2000, 2016 Veda Drive. Uh, this is, was proposed by Soft Rock Properties, LLC, uh, the application uh, for an amendment to the property located at that address. The property is currently zoned R2, single and two-family residential, and the request is to rezone the property to B3, General Commercial District. The owner plans to use the property to construct a hotel the property consists of approximately 0.385 acres and currently has a single family home. The ordinance and site plan for the rezoning has attached. The Planning Commission recommended the request for a joint public hearing with the City Council on December 20th, 2021. The joint public hearing was held on January 11th The request was of 2022. The request was recommended to the City Council for approval by the Planning Commission by a 4-2 vote at its January 18th, 2022 meeting. The request was approved by City Council at the February 8th, 2022 meeting. First reading of the ordinance was approved by City Council on February 22nd, 2022 meeting. Staff recommends approval of the zoning map amendment request on the second reading. Thank you. So we are looking for a motion to have the second reading and it can be a, by full reading or by caption only. Uh, I move for the second reading of the ordinance uh, to the zoning map amendment for the property located at 2016 Veda Drive by caption only. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any council discussion? Uh, I'll just say briefly, um, I look forward to the, uh, this being the first of many developments that we see happening on Gate City Highway in regard to, uh, in relation to the casino development. So. This is, uh, this is step one to um, change that corridor of the city and, uh, and realize some real economic growth. All right, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? No. Farnham? Yes. Reading of the ordinance by caption only. An ordinance by the City Council of Bristol, Virginia, approving the request by Soft Rock LLC to amend the city zoning map from single and two-family residential R2 to General Commercial District B3 for property described as 2016 Veda Drive, map parcel number 22-2-2-1 at 
a .25 acre parcel and 22-2-2 a .135 acre parcel. Okay, so now we're looking for a motion to adopt the ordinance. Uh, I move for adoption of the ordinance as presented. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? No. Farnham? Yes. Okay. The next item is our consent agenda. What's the pleasure of the council? I move for approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, a motion and a second to approve our consent agenda. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. All right, if there's no further business, we stand adjourned. <laughs>